Hi, this is Ren. And this is Mark Dunworth. And this is All Walks of Film. Today we are talking about <coughs> Sausage Party and how it treated its animators. Yes, there's since Sausage Party came out, there has been some talk that has occurred based on the two directors of the film doing a interview for the um, cartoon website Cartoon Brew. Uh, Is that Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen? Uh, no, not Evan. No, it's the actual directors of the film. Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg just wrote it and helped produce it. Um, it's Greg Tiernan and Conrad Vernon. They're the two. They're the two directors. Conrad Vernon was did uh, seems to have done the majority of the directing, and Greg Tiernan co-directed. Greg Tiernan's uh, Vancouver-based company, Nitrogen Studios, is the studio that animated the film. <clears throat> so, after this interview that they gave with Cartoon Brew, um, at one point Tiernan, it, at one point a question was brought up by the interviewer that we understand that the budget, from what we've been told, uh, was around nineteen to twenty million, and that's really low for the going rate of budgets for most animated films like this the to give a sort of a point of view on the whole most animated films start at a hundred a hundred million and then they go up from there yeah unless you're talking about like <coughs> russian animated films or like some films in the korea or right. something like that in the states if you're doing an animated film an all animated film and in, in this case a computer animated film it's the the price starts at a at a hundred million dollars. They and to follow up this, Tiernan openly said, "I can neither conf I can neither confirm nor deny that the budget was twenty million. What he did state was the budget was one that they felt worked for the work that they did, and <clears throat> based upon working for other companies and seeing." how unorganized they often were and how much money was often lost. They felt they could do a better job with a smaller budget and be able to turn in a better product that way. After that interview, a lot of, in the comments section, a lot of folks who would not come forward to say who they were but posted anonymously for fear of losing jobs or being blacklisted said that the working conditions at Nitrogen Studios was horrible and it's really awful that Greg Tiernan is talking about the fact about the budget and it being low or not willing to talk about it because it's so evident in what they did. They strong-armed animators apparently <clears throat> to work overtime without being paid for it um, to work long hours without providing any sort of meals, and if they wouldn't do this, uh, they were threatened with being fired and having their work handed over to other people, and in some cases, having the work handed to uh, brand new animation students who had just graduated college, who didn't know any better or know much about the industry at the time. And for some folks, it seems like some folks who complained or who left early um, from their contracts or whose contracts ended but they didn't renew their contracts to continue working on the film, those people's names were not in the credits. Yeah, and IMDb has 83 people listed for the animation team and only 47 of those were actually credited in the film's credits. That's correct. Um, Apparently, since this has happened, IMDb has been posting for for Sausage Party more and more people who worked on the film. Uh, in again, in this is going off of what anonymous posters are saying, and it seems to be more than one person, at least six or seven, if not more people, saying basically the same thing: that the movie was horribly under budgeted, that there should have been more money for this that they did not treat their staff terribly well <clears throat> and because of that they expected a huge amount of performance for not much money and 
It's an interesting thing because here's some nitty gritty things. Canada has funny laws when it comes to labor laws. It's a little bit like in the U.S. where the U.S. government will sometimes pass a law that's across the entire United States, but state to state differs in how they handle and dish out those laws. For Canada, it's if you work overtime, you're expected to be paid for overtime. It differs from the various provinces of Canada. For British Columbia, which is where Vancouver is, which is where... Nitrogen Studios is, which is also where a lot of animation studios are. The loophole is people who work high technological professions are exempt from being paid overtime. And in some provinces, it even gets extended of, okay, people who install swimming pools don't get paid overtime, or people who do this specific line of work don't get overtime. And although... As I read one article about this, the reporter said this may seem Dickensian to some people. The flip of it is, it's a law that's been established based upon people in that area of employment. The switch being, I won't work overtime. I won't get, I'll allow myself not to be paid for overtime. But the flip of it is, my company is going to be paying me a very high substantial wage. I'm going to be getting a lot of benefits as well and other things to make up for that. And so that's where, so it's like work is negotiating for something better. Also, I should mention Nitrogen Studios is not a union uh, studio. Unfortunately, with what Nitrogen Studios did is, from all accounts, their pay was very minimal for... um, this era, this field, they were paying a terribly large amount for what they were doing. They really didn't have many to no benefits. The studio is located in outside of the main city of Vancouver, of Vancouver, in a very, by all accounts, bad, sketchy neighborhood. So when you have people who are being strong armed in or intimidated into working long hours, and then they have to leave a studio at night which apparently is difficult to get to by conventional public transportation means, let alone by your car, and you're dealing with a bad neighborhood in the middle of it, that's going to create some problems, and that's what a lot of people had to deal with. So that's the flip of it. There's a loophole in Canadian law. They're kind of exploiting it. And because of that, a lot of animation studios in Canada, particularly in Vancouver, Use this as have been able to use this in a way to snipe jobs from Hollywood, not just from movies, but also video games too, because this also goes into the video game industry for computers. And unfortunately, if they were to look at their U.S. counterparts, they're unionized. They have things in place to protect them. You, it's not the same in Canada, and that's a major difference. But to be fair, uh, the United States in making films has often uh, walked the path of... The United States has often gone into gray zones by filming in other countries oh, very and, sure. and hiring people under um, shady business oh, very uh, sure. laws and everything like that, where it's like, oh, well, we're paying you the minimum wage in this country, right. <laughs> but that's not the minimum wage that we would pay anybody in this country. And that's a very good point to make. I mean... You know, something that happened several years ago, which kind of made this man... Actually, it created a documentary. I can't remember the title of it all all together. But something for people who work behind the scenes for just normal films, this law being passed of 12 on, 12 off. I work a 12-hour day, and I'm off for 12 hours until I have to show up for filming the next day. Therefore, it gives me the ability to sleep, to have a meal, to get home okay, and to get to the set okay. And I... And this happened from crew people literally driving home after a long, long day and crashing their cars and and killing themselves or killing others because they're falling asleep behind the wheel. So yes, this does happen in the United States. There's more reforms for it to happen in the United States. Yeah, Right now in Canada, if you work in the animation industry, this is apparently something that is like par for the course. It's understood by many people. If you're wanting to do animation, this is what happens. 
at least in Canada. Um, apparently, the other thing was they fell behind on the production for this film. It was apparent from many accounts it went behind a whole year and they were trying to dig themselves out of that without having to ask for more money. And by that point, people's contracts were expiring and they had to move on to other things because dealing with the working conditions they were under already, they were like, I don't want to stay here any longer for this. And for some people, their work visas expired. So they physically couldn't stay in the country any longer for this. But by many accounts, these folks were looked at as, oh, you're just being a problem. You don't want to come and keep working here. And you're just going to give this work to somebody else to do. It's like, no, this is a bad company. I don't want to work here anymore. Or I got a better offer to work someplace else that is paying me more and giving me more benefits. You're not giving me any more than this. So because of that, I have no loyalty to you. Yeah, and I think that's a big problem with businesses now is they, they're they oftentimes complacent about tr- working conditions and everything like that because they feel that that's profit. But here's the thing. In the long run, if you treat your workers like shit, that, that passes down the pipeline. You're going to have a hard time finding people who want to work with you outside of people who don't live in the country mm-hmm. in many cases. And from all accounts, the team of people, the team of animators who worked on this, who have spoken out, <coughs> and who have also gone on into other articles to be interviewed, the majority of them have stated that they were really excited to work on this film. This was something that was way out of the way of what they would normally have to do. A few have disagreed here and there about some of the content of the film, excuse me, and whether or not they agreed with it or not, but for the most part, the majority of people all agreed, no, we really believed in this movie. We really wanted to work on this movie. We, you know, came from the U.S. and other countries to work on this movie, and we had a lot of faith in it. We wanted to do something different that wasn't just the kids' stuff and family stuff we had done before, so we really went the extra mile. And then in the end, we would get screamed at, we would get yelled at, we would, and then we wouldn't have a a credit at the end of the film. And not having a credit at the end of the film for companies like this, it's hit and miss. I mean, there's some people on Cartoon Brew's website who work in the animation field who were kind of shutting down these animators speaking out, going like, oh, you didn't get a credit? Well, boo-hoo, sometimes that just doesn't happen. And others coming out saying, hey, listen, I've worked for a number of studios in the past. Not getting a credit happens, but the majority of the time, the studio gives you a heads up and say, hey, we you know, didn't have enough room. We didn't have enough money to put a longer credit sequence together. Your name won't be in the credit, but we want to let you know you did a wonderful job. We couldn't have done this movie without you. And therein lies the difference. And they would have IMDb credit, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. It, it, and, it does, and for some people... There were some people, and these are also people who are current Nitrogen employees, Nitrogen Studio employees, being like, I don't understand what the problem is. They're a wonderful company. You, you, you people expected them to bend over backwards for you, and they did their what, what did their job for you. And other folks going, you know, my loyalty is only with a company who can treat people decently, and they didn't. They it seems like they treated people higher up decent, but not a lot of folks coming in who were brand new who were working on the film. And in some cases, for folks who many considered like traitors somehow for abandoning the project to go work someplace else and then their film wasn't in the credits, I'm sorry, but you still put that person on the film credited. doesn't matter if they stayed through the entire project or not. Did they touch the film in some, some way creatively? They did. Then you give them credit. It, there's no other way around it. And it seems that, uh, I mean, not only with animation companies, but there does seem to be a precedence um, in a lot of studios to do stuff like this, to um, pressure people into giving so many hours towards a film, threatening to replace them if they do not meet really 
extraneous work requirements. And uh, <coughs> then, you know, if they're, if they're upset or anything like that, they can actually get sued if they say anything, which is, of course, why they have to be anonymous about it. I uh, posted a video recently about um, an ex Warner Brothers employee who was really upset with um, where the DC universe is going. And uh, of course, there's some speculation on whether or not that was a real article or mm -hmm. whether it was just something that somebody made claiming that they were working for Warner Brothers. But I mean, the truth of the matter is, is like, you, in order to be a successful company, um, I, I think treating your workers well needs to be in there just because like you want people putting out the best work they can. Mm -hmm. When you put people under pressure um, without really any payoff, then your work suffers from it. Oh, it does. And this, and to, to comment on that, it's a, it's a very, it's a very meat grinder way of looking at a creative process. I it's, think probably even the delays that happened were because people were so fucking tired mm -hmm. that they couldn't produce. Well, some of the delays yeah. that happened from some sources were because the initial cut of the film was an NC-17 rating that got them an NC-17 rating. That they were having issues with the script and having to rework the script a bit. Because of that, and I think also because of what their staff issues were at the time, basically it seems like Nitrogen Studios promised a lot. They bit off more than they can chew. They thought they could do something with the staff that they had. Up until this point, the thing that they had really done were computer animated um, episodes for a Thomas the Tank Engine show. This was their first major film. And, and I could see somebody who's making Thomas the Tank Engine animations feeling like this is the best thing in the world because at least they're not making something for fucking toddlers anymore. Right, and this was... And so... And, and this is, again, this is Greg Tiernan's company. And this is apparently the gentleman that the majority of animators had the problem with. Um, Conrad Vernon, the main director... No one seems to really have much of a problem with him. He comes from DreamWorks. He directed, I believe, three, if not four, DreamWorks films, one of them being uh, Aliens vs. Monsters, which is how he knows Seth Rogen. They pitched the idea to him. He loved it. He brought in Greg Tiernan. Greg Tiernan and Conrad Vernon had worked previously with Ralph Bakshi, another animator, on the movie Cool World back in the 90s. Another so, movie that was tinkered around and, with. Right. But it's the idea, totally different right. than what it originally was supposed to be. But the idea being, hey, Conrad Vernon, here's a guy who's directed stuff for DreamWorks. He knows what he's doing, which Seth Rogen and his crew went, we don't know anything about animated films. That's why we want to hire people who do so that we don't fuck this up. Great. They go to Conrad Vernon because he's there in because Seth Rogen's worked with him previously on a DreamWorks film. Conrad Vernon then goes to his friend, Greg uh, Greg Tiernan who has who, the, who, have, who, who they have worked together who now at this point has his own company in Vancouver called Nitrogen Studios will, will, would your company be able to do the animation for this film we don't have a lot of money because not a lot of people are interested in investing a money for a computer animated adult film which is another issue Tiernan says yes, he and his wife are the ones who run the company, but this is their first major film, they've only done TV up until this point, and their, their pipeline of work is only built to do TV up to this point. So, it seems like that is a big issue for them, and what happened, that they took on a project that was way too big, they made promises that they couldn't keep, not just to the producers like Seth Rogen, but to the animators who worked on the film, and then it came to bite them in the ass. And also, like I mentioned before, this idea of meat grinding to make a creative product, it happens in Hollywood all the time, and that's, this is no different in the animation field. The idea being, well, if you won't do it, there's a hundred people lighting outside the door who want to do it, who are fresh out of college, 
who are you know professionals who are desperate to get work in a very competitive field they'll do it even though maybe some of them know that we're difficult to work with they'll do it just to get a check because this is all they know how to do or that and experience or experience or they're honestly too ignorant because they're fresh out of college and don't know the business well enough and they'll do anything until the world until the reality comes crashing down on them and it's unfortunately it's a mindset of not just Hollywood but a lot of even conventional civilian jobs these days the idea that if you don't want to do the work fine the recession's bad there's a lot of people who are willing to do this and it's like great so now you have me stuck between a rock and a hard place and it's it's desperation out of everybody it's desperation out of the, out of the studio or the employer to do the thing because they've made promises to other people that now they can't keep it's desperation out of the employees to want to keep up a job in a uh, climate of not many jobs in the field or just an economic depression not having a ton of jobs period for anybody and it's desperation out of people trying to get into the field and there not being a lot of jobs because the f- various fields are, are corrupt with cronyism and nepotism and favoritism and I won't do this unless you do this for me sort of way of getting work it's not who you it's not what you know it's who you know Just out of curiosity, uh, based on how much was cut from the animators, like the fact that the animators were um, not credited and in some cases not paid overtime, is there a possibility that they could sue the company? Very much so, because these, right now, it's becoming a very big trend in Canada for employees to do large... um, Massive mass lawsuits against certain employers. So in this case, I think it would be smart for businesses to treat their employees right because if they don't, right. they could possibly lose more money because of lawsuits that are set. Exactly. A precedent has been set. And although it may differ from province to province in Canada, it can happen. Because here's the thing. It's one of those loopholes where it's like, is this legal? It's not illegal. And to have this wording in such a way, which is people in a high technological professional field, that that can be applied to a lot of different fields. It can be applied to someone who's actually fixing a computer. And in this case, it's applying to people who are who are creative artists looking to animate a feature film. Those two things shouldn't be in the same boat, but they are because it's a very narrow pigeonhole of black and white use. And because of that, they're getting taken advantage of. And in some cases, they're allowing themselves to be taken advantage of um, for certain people. But again, it's this... It's new laws that are trying to catch. It's laws that are trying to catch up to where the world is now, and a big place of where, big part of where the world is now is the internet, and it is computers, and is what people can and cannot do using computers now. And because of that, there's a lot of fuzzy gray area that, for some people, works to their benefit, and for other people, it works to their detriment. Yeah, and also like one of the big things that's been happening recently is employees posting things anonymously to Reddit or other sources talking about uh, corruption and malpractice uh, within the company. And since they can't fully track down the person, um, it's exposing the world to how these companies are actually treating people. And I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel to some extent um, because it's, I, I want these people to be scared about treating their employees like shit because um, it it's morally, I mean, at least in my opinion, it's morally wrong. And I, I think that they should have to pay financially to understand that this is a stupid business practice. I'll agree. I mean, <clears throat> just to give folks a better idea, this is reading directly. Um, this is a supervisor who worked on the film, he posted anonymously after the interview with Cartoon Brew came out with Conrad uh, Vernon and Greg Tiernan. The production cost 
Costs were kept low because Greg would Greg Tiernan would demand people work overtime for free. If you wouldn't work late for free, or your work would be assigned to someone who would stay late or come in on the weekend. Some artists were even threatened with termination for not staying late to hit a deadline. The animation department signed a petition for better treatment and paid overtime. When the letter got to Annapurna, who was the other major backer for this movie, as an independent and independent uh, film producing company, they stepped in and saw that artists were paid overtime and fed when overtime was needed. Over 30 animators left during the course of the production due to the stress and the expectations. Most of them left before the paid overtime was implemented. This would this was met with animosity and was taken as a personal insult to the owners, Greg Tiernan and his wife, who owned the company. Their names were omitted from the final credits despite working for over a year on this film. And that's also something to keep in mind. This film production was only supposed to be a year. It went to almost two years for various reasons, some which have come forward um, to be different cuts of the film needing to be made and script reworks to other things that have been unconfirmed, such as, you know, whether or not it was an NC-17 rating or not. So... There you go. There's some of it. Do you think that there's going to be an uncut version of the film? Or like a... Well, from what I understand, the reason why in the, the reason why Sausage, Sausage Party only ran 89 minutes is because they looked at the cost. Animation is a cost per minute entity. You can't do it by the hour. Like, how much is this going to cost an hour to make filming-wise, yada, yada. It all comes down to because it's animation and it takes longer, how much does it cost per minute to make the to make what we need for a feature like film for animation? That's why it was only 89 minutes long. They knew going in, this is a comedy, we need to keep it short for that reason. Also, it's extremely expensive to do this, so we can't make it any longer than we need to because of that. And apparently Seth Rogen has even publicly said he did not expect this movie to look as good as it did. He went in thinking, with the understanding, that some of the animation was apparently going to look a little bit cruder, it was going to look a little bit rougher, but overall he was still going to be pleased with everything, and when it came out to look as nice as it did, it surprised him. Which also goes to show, apparently, what the expectations were going into it versus what came out. And in the Cartoon Brew interview, the interviewer says, you made a $100 million looking animated film for a budget reported to be only $19 million. How did you do that? And the answer was, we had a very dedicated team of people who really believed in the project, and we were very organized. That flies in the face of what's coming out now. They were very unorganized. They threatened their employees. They didn't pay them overtime, even though legally they weren't obligated to. They could have. And that's how they got the movie done. Which, before I even saw the movie, I was actually hesitant to watch the movie after this came out. Yes. Because I... Which is also something that we debated um, for folks. You know, there is a Sausage Party review um, that we did... And going initially, we were only going to talk about this issue with the animators, and then we decided, should we see the film or not? And apparently a number of the animators are going, by all means, see this film, because so many of us worked so hard on this. If you don't see it, it kind of flies in the face of all the hard work and hours we put in, even if some of us didn't get credited for it. We really believed in this project. We really want to see more work like this being done, especially in the States, see the movie. And that's why we decided, well, let's go see this because we can, you know, comment about, well, was this film worth all of this? And was it really worth the sort of strike, the, the sort of struggle that so many people went through? And I think on the whole, yeah, I had mixed feelings about the movie. Ren, you enjoyed it quite a bit, but I think we both agreed on the fact that this movie, in its way, can help 
other films come out that are aimed specifically at an adult audience not necessarily an adult audience that is strictly going to enjoy an animated film because it has people cursing and fucking and there's drug use but the fact that there can be an adult film with adult material that adults will understand they're not appropriate for children or would go over the heads of children but therefore it's still a good film and that's the big point I think that's the big point that they were trying to make too. Yeah, and hopefully the treatment that has been exposed now sets a precedence for future films to come mm -hmm. because I don't want to hear about this happening to more successful R-rated comedies or um, dramas that are animated. I agree. Um, I mean, to do a comparison of another animation company in the states there's pixar and from all accounts if you ever for folks who have taken a tour of the pix of the pixar studios it is a it is a multiplex of a place it they try to make that building and their campus all encompassing so that anything you could possibly want or need be it from sh uh, chefs that can make you gourmet food to places that you can, you know, stretch out to take a nap, to childcare, to, you know, a game room with video games and all points in between a swimming pool so you can actually get some exercise. They have. The flip side of it is it's there so you don't have to leave so that you will stay there and then continue working on the film that you're doing. Um, the plus side of that being that you're getting your exercise, you're having your needs met, and uh, it's helping you relax at work mm -hmm. and helping your creative process. Because I know, as far as I'm concerned, like getting proper exercise, um, you know, being able to feel free while I'm working helps my creative process. And, and that's the flip side for Pixar versus a place like Nitrogen Studios. Um, you know, granted, it's a little bit like comparing apples and oranges because of how big of a studio Pixar is versus Nitrogen. Um, but again, it's not so far to compare them in how they treat their employees. You have one studio who, I mean, even if Nitrogen didn't have you know money to install a pool for people to swim in or something, there's little things that you can do as a company. It's like, hey, we can't pay a... Um, Unemployment, we, not unemployment, we can't pay you overtime, but we can make sure that if you're staying late, we're going to be ordering dinner for you guys so that you don't have to worry about where your meal's coming from. Because apparently in this neck of the woods that their studio's in, after 6 o'clock, everything, everything shuts down. You're not getting any food. You know, any place around is going to be closed. And unless you brought something, you were stuck with no dinner that night. And you may be leaving like a you know, in the middle, in the wee hours in the morning. Yeah, and probably so. the only plus side is, you know, there's a vending machine that has, like, soda and possibly ramen noodles if, or something like that. If that, but it's, again, it's the flip side. Does it have to be that you have a, you know, a, uh, a Pixar-level thing of perks? No. Could there have been something perk-wise for people to be like, you know, this isn't that bad of a place? Yes. Was that done? No, it wasn't. Because of that... You have what you have. And that's one of the pluses, sometimes minuses, but mostly pluses of living in this age that we're in with the internet, with computers. It's made the world a much smaller place, which has also meant the sharing of information is much more instant and intimate. You know, sometimes, of course, that can go downhill with people who are, you know, denying climate change or, you know, that, you know, promoting Trump as a wonderful president choice. But the flip side is something like this to, can come to light. Yeah, which, or the Sony leaks that or the that Sony or the happened. Sony or the Sony leaks as well, um, which brought a lot of things to light. Or in the and th this company mm -hmm. was the company that was under fire with the Sony leaks because yeah. you know this was produced by mm -hmm. Sony, and yes. as as far as the films that have come out, this is their biggest success. Yes, uh, it is their biggest success because recently. Yes, because you know. 
all things considered, the budget undoubtedly is probably around nineteen to twenty million dollars. Opening weekend, Sausage Party made thirty five million. They've already made their money back almost twice as much as of right now domestically. Second weekend, they're the top movie, and I should say the top comedy in America, and they've made eighty nine million. That number's probably changed as of right now, but uh, as of the time you're listening to this. But as of right now, they have more than made their money back fourfold. And they will undoubtedly be making it more. It is the... And the flip side of it also is, um, even though this is a Sony film, Sony did not break its bank to promote this film. It was mostly promoted on the back of Seth Rogen and his crew of guys promoting the film in an interesting, different way, mostly using online promotions, showing the film at South by Southwest as an early cut, having Seth Rogen appear um, in the Super Bowl in a commercial online um, where he's sort of portraying a Walt Disney-esque figure in a very 1930s-looking animation studio telling people, we're working on a wonderful movie called Sausage Fest. Why don't you come and take a look? And that's extremely clever. It's definitely, it's very funny because it's showing a very new and intelligent way to sell your creative idea even though that project is being released by a company... Sony that has very old and outdated ways of doing business in this industry now. And that's another big thing to consider. And by all accounts, it seems like what was going on with the animators was kept away from the producers. It was kept away from Seth Rogen. It was kept away from you know the writers in the film. It seems like it may have even been kept away from Conrad Vernon, um, who was who, who directed the film, and it was really Craig Tiernan, who in the movie also plays the voice of the potato, so he's in the movie, um, and it was just kept under staff that the produce that Sony didn't know what was going on, that the other pro- producing company didn't know what was going on, and it wasn't until they wrote, the work, the animators wrote a letter to the other production company directly that they go, oh my god, we had no idea. Yes, we will pay you overtime. We will pay you overtime out of our own pocket, and we'll make sure you get a meal if you're staying late. This is ridiculous. So... Do you think yeah. Sony might step in and try to uh, mediate the situation, or do you think that they're just going to kind of write it off as that's business? I think they'll write it off because the other production company has stepped forward already. Okay. Because do you think that they're going to uh, make concessions to the people that have been uh, disenfranchised? I doubt it because Sony, I think, has already made their money back on this rather as far as they're concerned risky investment of an adult animated film about talking food fucking each other and having religious existential crises this is a gamble on their end they didn't invest much money into it they only they invested just enough it's paid off and then some to look at it as a very black and white point of look take on it they have little to no interest they've already gotten their money. They're moving on to another project. It'll be whether or not Seth Rogen and his crew want to continue using Nitrogen Studios for other projects in the f- in the future because they, with this coming to light, I'm, I'm certain, I have no doubt because this has now been out, this news has now been out for over a week and has hit you know, major news outlets like the Washington Post online that Seth Rogen will hear about it at some point and this will be brought to his attention and then it'll be hit on his end and be like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a dick and work with this company again if you do anything else in animation? Could this turn you off to doing more things with animation because it makes you feel like you were duped and you don't want to be duped again? Or are you going to be like, no, that's not right. I want to still do it. I still want to do projects in animation, but I need to. I need to look into it and do it in a better way, and maybe have a more hands-on take on things. And since Seth Rogen is the poster boy for this project, yeah, he's the face. I, 
I do think that there is an expectation for him to make a public statement. Yeah, I have no doubt when and if that'll happen is is the big thing. Um, also, I mean, if this information is given to him and is brought to his attention in a very public way, of course he'll be forced to have to say something about it. I mean, Greg Tiernan's wife, her name escapes me right now, I think her name is Nicole, um, has already made statements um, about the animators and this issue, saying that these, these accusations are baseless, and well, that's just typical and, lingo that they right, say. Right, exactly. But any sort of detail information, she's, I have no comment. I have no comment. I have no comment. Greg Tiernan has not come forward at all about any of this. Of course, because he's it used, would hurt their he's, business he's, to he's, admit he's, this. He's, he's hidden behind his, his wife, who's one of the other co-owners of the company. So even the person who everyone is accusing of having done this, he's not, he's not, saying, he's not saying shit at all about this. And whether or not... Seth Rogen comes out about this because that was something that some just casual posters on, on Cartoon Brew were coming about. It's like, oh my God, Seth Rogen's a monster. He let this happen. And then a lot of animators were posting, came forward, be like, I have no doubt he didn't know anything about this because they were undoubtedly keeping it from him. Why would they tell him about this? Because this is just this would just possibly turn him off to using the company. And that's usually how it goes. The production company does a very good job of masking from the rest of the world, particularly the money people or the talent, that things are running anything, uh, running extremely hunky dory. There's no problems whatsoever. Or you know, Seth Rogen could take this, and th- this is a long stretch. Yeah. But since Seth Rogen does have a lot of money and he's right. made a lot of successful projects, he could. Um, you know, nudge a company to start um, and hire some of the people that uh, that were working on this film and sort of create his own production company. Well, that's kind of what happened when this movie was happened, when this movie was going on. A lot of people were leaving Nitrogen and then working for Sony Animated. Uh, so, we're just working for Sony's company and apparently it was like a mass migration of people being like, I'm not working for them. But Sony's backing us. But Sony is the company releasing it. I'm gonna find a job with them, and they've gotten a lot of people to work for them now. Unfortunately, via default, because they left a crappier company. But you know, who knows if they're going from excuse me out of the frying pan and into the fire with that. But still, it's creating um, a sort of vacuum for, to bring people in. But yeah, who knows? It might have. It's very much the same way that um, Steven Spielberg with oh, Don Bluth when they were doing American Tale and then Land Before Time and then finally Don Bluth was like, nah, I'm going to do my own thing and left Spielberg kind of high and dry and then Spielberg was like, well, I still want to do animation. Fine, I'll do my own animation stuff. And then he did. And then... That was DreamWorks. And what is Don Bluth doing? Not a whole lot. And that's very... Rock and doodle. And uh, that... Uh, <laughs> recently, that's very telling. Tight I mean, he... I think I think he's tried to do a, start, a Kickstarter campaign not too long ago to um, uh, do an animated film version of Dragon Quest. Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair. Yes. So that happened not too long ago. But still, it's like... That's a very good example he had the perfect situation he was with Steven Spielberg who was the biggest he was Steven Spielberg was king king shit at Turd Mountain in the 80s and he wants to use your animation studio after you kind of fucked over Disney and left them high and dry and dragged a lot of animators from them in the 70s to do your own thing now you're basically saying well I think I can do my own stuff kind of go fuck you and I'll do my own thing it's like and no, during that period, I think like those are some of the best animated films that exist. I think The Lamb Before Time is amazing. It is. And it's definitely one of the most influential films on my life. It's, it, it, is, it is a very good film. Um, and if you don't like the idea of talking dinosaurs, it's a beautiful movie to, to watch. Sort of, it's sort of the best. It's like 
the dinosaur it's the rites of spring from the fan, original Fantasia film but stretched over an entire length of film and yes yeah, some of the designs of some of the di- dinosaurs are dated but they're accurate for the time and that's something to keep in mind and yeah so this movie has issues with it um and there's going to be issues in any field that has a lot of creativity, but at the same time has a very factory-like setting. Um, I come from an area of uh, working on puppets and prop building for theatrical companies and even companies that have done stuff for film and television. and. In cases like that, you're part of a shop, you're a cog in a machine, but at the same time, you're expected to do very high levels of creative work, but keep that same rate for what you're doing. And I have have friends who also work in the field who do stuff for film and television, and it's still very either on the production end or they're in the performance end, and it's still very much the same way. I had a friend who at one point worked for Leica, who is the company that right now has the film Kubo of the Two Strings out. And their experience was, again, very precise, very detailed miniature work because this is a stop motion film. And the people, in, her, the people involved who were the supervisors were very demanding and very task manager oriented and when my friend was just like you know what I'm done I'm leaving the supervisors were like but we're Leica you're leaving us yeah because you're dicks and because you don't treat people this way and you certainly don't treat the artists who are working for you this way she worked on uh, Paranorman and her name wasn't in the credits a lot of people's names weren't in the credits because of it. They worked on the film, but they weren't there. And it's because sometimes companies like that be like, oh, the worker bees won't get you know that big of a thing. They did this, 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 and it's like, all right, fine. But that still is that still is a dick move. Um, but again, you're a cog in a machine. You're part of a bigger entity that's creating art. Which, when you think about it, is sometimes amazing how any films get made. Because so many people are involved that when something finally gets done, and then you read about what happened with it, how did this thing ever get off the ground? There are more films that have not been made than the films that have been made. And unfortunately, a lot of those films that have, that have not been made are a hell of a lot better than the films that did get made. And it's just, unfortunately, the way of the world. But, yeah, the issues with Sausage... Sausage... sausage I keep saying Sausage because I'm in Chicago. I guess the issues with Sausage Party are what they are, but things are changing. And it's especially because news like this can get out. And even though these people may have their deniers who either want to toe the company line and go, everything's fine, I don't understand what their problem was. Still, it's enough people coming forward to say, I wasn't treated well, I was disrespected. There's one post of a woman who just interviewed with the company listing the sort of red flags going into it, being like, all right, this is red flag number one. This is another red flag, and this is why I didn't work on the film with them. Um, Let me see if I can try to find it really quick. Okay. There was something about a penis desk, which is what sort of made me go, what is this all about? (laughs) What? Yes, let me... Okay, I guess. And this, this woman lists herself on the Cartoon Brew comment section as female CG artist. 
She says, I'm late to the party on this, but I have a story pertaining to Sausage Party as well. I actually interviewed to be an artist. I can't say which department without exposing myself and not reading the post right now. But this is a major reason why people are not saying what their names are because they're getting flack for, well, you have if what you're saying is the truth, well, why aren't you giving your name? And these people are all saying the same thing. I can't. Because, yeah, I'm under, work, because I'm either under contract or I work in such a if I'm even if, if even if I'm not I work in such a niche industry that if I do and if people know who I am I unfortunately for some of the jerks who run some of these companies who do offer employment can blacklist me and be like no don't hire this person. They're a troublemaker, and by troublemaker we mean they expect to be treated fairly, and then we'll make a fuss about it. So that's another thing to consider. These people are terrified of not being able to work in their city and having to be like, well, I can't work in Canada anymore in animation. I guess I'll have to move to the States and start my life over again in, a new, in this field in a new country. On the production last year, and the interview itself was a total disaster. Red flag number one. When I came for the interview, I noticed Nitrogen Studios was in a very rough part of Vancouver that I wouldn't feel safe walking in after long days on production. I'm a woman, and I felt deeply unsafe walking from the bus stop to the studio. So this studio was accessible to public transportation, but for people who are leaving late at night, and apparently there's drug addicts and other homeless people trying to sell you things or cost you. That's intimidating. It's also intimidating if you're a woman in this situation and you don't know what's going on. Again, it's even intimidating for a man in this situation because who, know what, who knows what can happen. I got accosted by both a wheelchair-bound vagrant and a prostitute on my walk over to the interview, and that was in broad daylight. It was surreal. Anyone who has physically been to Nitrogen Studios knows what I'm talking about. Red flag number two. When I got to the interview, I was led into one of the production supervisor's offices. And when I sat down, she apologized for having to sit me, a female applicant, at the, quote, the penis desk, unquote. When I asked what the penis desk was, she showed me that the table I was sitting at was phallic shaped and had post-it notes of a hand-drawn penises stuck all over it. I hadn't noticed it at first because I was too busy introducing myself and shaking hands with the other supervisors in the room. Two male supervisors plus the female production supervisor conducted the interview. Apparently she had gone on vacation and while she was out, the other workers stuck these hand-drawn penises all over her desk as a joke. When she came back from vacation, they convinced her to keep them on for kicks and giggles. It was humiliating to be a woman interviewing for a senior level artist position at a desk covered in hand-drawn dicks. Red flag number three. The, the people, go ahead. Oh yeah, in, in the United States, if you had done that in the United States, there would be a sexual harassment lawsuit just oh, very outright. Much, very much so. I mean, it's totally inappropriate, even if, if, even if it's with a female supervisor who thinks it's, he thinks it's a hilarious joke. People can come into your office at any point in time, apparently, because you're letting someone in now for an interview. If you didn't know the person was coming in for an interview, you could have been, hold on one minute, close the door, let me get these dicks off this desk so it looks presentable for a new applicant coming in. Right, and like, even in... Uh and when I was in the military, you couldn't even have a picture of, like, you know, a Sports Illustrated picture because that would be construed as sexual harassment and you could possibly get in trouble for it. And that's the same with a lot of businesses now. Well, Like, you can't even have scantily clad women showing. I mean, there is a weird uh, double standard where women and gay men can kind of do it. But, well, like, as well, far as heterosexual male sexuality stuff... It well, right, red flag. well, rightfully so. It shouldn't be tolerated in either way. It shouldn't be tolerated with Jim who wants to put his Sports Illustrated swimsuit calendar up. And it shouldn't be tolerated with Barb who wants to put her hunky fireman calendar up. It's either it's both, it's good on, for both or it's bad for neither. We don't get to play favorites with this. Or Kyle who wants to put up his hunky fireman calendar. Whatever it is. Red flag three. 
The people interviewing me all complained that animators were quitting right and left because they were offended by the film's content. I had heard rumors similar to what uncredited supervisor, one of the other posters earlier in, on the comments section, said about people walking off the job for not being paid, which is another issue that happened. But this was the first I was hearing about the film being so offensive that it caused people to quit. Because of this, the people interviewing me showed me three in-progress sequences from the film, all of which were enormously offensive. Having worked in the film industry for years, it really takes a lot to shock me, but I was not prepared to have a room full of supervisors watch me watch scenes involving drug use and food sex to see if I could handle it. In the moment, I told them I found it funny, but inside, I felt disgusted. And that's another thing where it's just like, let's see if, you'll, if you're cool. Let's see if you're gonna go with this. It's like, this seems like a weird initiation thing versus interviewing for a job. I wouldn't want to have anything to do with this either. I'm with this person. Well, also, like, they made animation stuff like Thomas the Tank Engine. So if you're going yeah. in expecting to work on shit like Thomas the Tank Engine, and you're given something like Sausage Party, I could actually understand why you would get offended. Well, here's the flip thing. Apparently, they made it clear to their staff, this is an adult film, this is what the script is. They were able to read the script. They had to because they had to animate this. So they knew going in what it was. I think perhaps with some of the rewrites and things that happened, it took some people like, what the hell is this? And yada, yada, yada. So I think, again, I don't think the staff was unaware of the content, but I think some changes to the content that got added or taken out made them go, I don't feel comfortable with this. Red flag number four, I was given a tour of the facility and I kept a mental tally of how many women I saw working there. Now to be fair, this was happening around lunchtime, so I understand a lot of people were right from their desks, but the count was in the single digits, which was enormously disappointing. I have worked for studios that had that toxic frat boy culture, and the way it was decorated and staffed definitely screamed that this was one of them. Which, if that's the case, that's, that's terribly unfortunate. I mean, all of these fields need to have both men and women in them equally. And for any woman to go into a situation where it's like, all right, oh great, I feel comfortable from the beginning, and I haven't even met many people here yet. Awesome, but I can see the traces of what this place is without even seeing the occupants. Yeah, but I, I can say the other way around too. Like sometimes it's uncomfortable working in an environment that's predominantly women because you always feel that you're being, you know, judged or everything that you say is going to be offensive. Right. And, right. you know, it's, it's a different precedent that's set. Right. Red flag number five, and this is the final point. I was informed the movie was a year behind schedule. And they had to make a ton of substantial cuts to it because it had gone into NC-17 territory and they were told to tone it down. After the interview, I went home completely shocked at what I had witnessed. Nitrogen called a day later to offer me the position and I politely turned it down. It has remained the only job I have ever turned down on moral grounds in my time as an animator. And that's... That's very telling. Again, this echoes again what a lot of other people have, other animators have said about this. It's like it's a horrible part of town. Yeah, I get it. They're a small studio. They want to save on money, but shit, there's other places in Vancouver they can go that isn't going to threaten po the possible safety of their staff. Other other people who have come out to argue against these animators and that point of like, I'm sorry. Was there a homeless person staring at you while you drew? No. But there was several when I had to wait for the bus to show up in the middle of the night and them trying to sell me drugs and shit or just screaming at me because they have an undiagnosed mental problem. I shouldn't have to deal with that just because I'm working an animation job. Yeah, they should have provided some sort of shuttle service or something Or like that. just pay them for overtime to be like, okay, great, by all means, take a, we're going to get taxis to take you home. I know this is a long night. Don't worry, we'll take care. We'll take care of something so that you can get home safe. Because I know we're in a bad part of town. Again, these are little things that they could have done. 
if they had enough foresight to do it, provided they had enough money to do it, but still, it sounds like they bit off more they can... The moral of the story seems to be they bit off more that they can chew. They're a company that's still primarily in TV and now is doing did their first major motion film. They agreed to too much so that they could get the job and undercut other people, mainly other, you know, U.S.-based companies or even other Canadian companies, and their workers suffered for it. And now... Greg Tiernan gets to promote the film and rub elbows with Seth Seth Rogen and his crew for right now. Hopefully it comes to light of what happened and something is done about it. Yeah, because with the success of the film, I I don't like the feeling knowing that they're not even going to acknowledge the people that got screwed over. I mean, they should at least mention it in an off comment. Yeah. At this point, you know, it's too late for them to go back and add the credits, add these credits into the film. The film's already out. If anything, they've done a better job to add it to IMDb, which is good, but it is great. It's sort of paying lip service to this. If anything, the best thing would be, when this comes out on DVD, you put these goddamn credits in. And that's what you do. Yeah, you and extend you, it, and it, you and you make good on this because if you don't, you're just being you're you're continuing to be a shit, which it might be good now, exactly. but it will bite you in the ass later. Oh, very much so. Because if anything, this is just going to be a telltale sign that, I mean, even though people in the industry may may accept this as yeah, this is just what happens. Money people may not like it and may go, oh, no, I don't want to give money to a company that's going to treat its, its employees poorly versus, you know, the thing they may not know is like, listen, you go to any of these companies, they're going to treat their employees poorly. But that was the company on the news. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, they're going to lose money for it now. And another thing that happens when this sort of thing comes out is they clean house and they start outsourcing jobs. Like they'll get people from India, yeah. you know, especially but they will also get people from you know other third world countries to work on projects that aren't going to complain because their pay compared to what minimum wage pay would be in their country is a lot higher. Well, to a degree, you're only going to get so many people who can do this level of work though, and I think what they're banking what they banked on the most with this was handing out the work to st- student employees people these were these were people who were fresh out of animation school and were looking for work or were willing to travel to Canada to look for work and they got these jobs because they were naive enough they were desperate enough and they just they were ignorant enough and they didn't know any better from what one of the other posts said all of the work done in the trailer was done by student or uncredited people. And so, so does that mean that they were uh, possibly working under... Um, like they were like, as for, like sort of the equivalent of like scabs working against a union strike sort of thing or even though it's unionized? I can't think of the word right now. Being able to lowball them with a lower price versus what they would normally pay? Maybe. Um, it all depends on the person that they were dealing with. If they were dealing with maybe a savvy enough student who did research, like, well, you can't fool me. I know what the minimum is. The flip of this also is well, what they were willing to pay people was apparently very low to very average for the industry, for other animation studios, which was a reason why a lot of people left when their contracts and visas were expired. It's like, you can't pay me anymore. I have a thing with another studio now. You don't. You're not giving me much incentive, and you're horribly stressing me out. You're not giving me a lot of incentive to stay. Do you think some of the students were unpaid interns? Because that seems to happen a lot. Even though, like, it's actually officially been declared illegal now. Mm-hmm. But I go on to websites promoting jobs for film studios, and they are still hiring people for unpaid internships. And it's one of those things where it's like, can I report them? Because technically, that is illegal in the United States. 
What is the legal loophole around that right now? That I don't know, and I, I don't know what the legal loophole is for that in Canada. I don't know if that was the case for the work for this particular studio on this project. It seems like when people mention students working on this film, it seems to suggest that it was people fresh out of animation school who were looking for work versus maybe veterans working in the field who had been doing this sort of thing for several years or you know maybe several decades. So that that's the impression I get when they mention work was completed by students. See, I, I get the impression that it's unpaid interns, but, th you know, that's... It might be a mix of both. It might be a mix of both. It depends on the skill set of who they're bringing in. It might be a mix of, okay, this is basic enough stuff that even an intern can do it, versus some of the higher level stuff we have to give to maybe people fresh out of college. And all the really complicated stuff, we have to give it to the professionals who've been here who have been even giving us problems with this. Yeah, and based on the quality of animation, like, yeah. it looks professional. It, it, looks... Does, it does look professional. It looks very polished. I mean, you can, you can argue about the character design, but that's different than the animation in and of itself. Um, I had some issues with some of the character designs, but the animation and the lighting and everything... Looks looks great. Looks like something you would see in a Pixar film and a DreamWorks film. In fact, they were pulling a lot of inspiration from Toy Story for the film to be like, we want a certain look like this because it's a recognizable look. And we're also going to take this and stand it on its head as well and and subvert it. So yeah, that is what's going on right now with Sausage Party. It is making a lot of money. Um, I have no doubt by next weekend it'll easily have made, have, have, it'll easily have hit the $100 million mark and probably surpassed it because it's already, you know, at this time of recording at $89 million. And the next step will be, well, where do we go from here? Is anything going to change with animation? Because, uh, again, this is also a problem in the States, too. Even though there are places, even though there are unions for animators at major studios like Disney, like Pixar, like DreamWorks, the special effects and the, the visual effects industry has dealt with this for several years where a major company will get the bid to do the computer effects for a film. They can only do so much, so then they sell off the work to a smaller company because perhaps that smaller company is not a union company and it goes down the line. Even the smaller companies will sell something off to a smaller company and yada and yada and yada. Those guys, some, a lot of them aren't treated well and it's because it's the same thing. I can get someone else who can do this job just as well as you can. Um, so you don't want to do it fine. I'll, I'll usually find a replacement, and then you get a, and then you get a can tied to your tail of oh this is a complainer. We we'll put him on the blacklist. We won't use him at all. I mean it was no different when animation was done two dimensional with cells. Yeah, I, because there were so many. Back in the old days, I mean, uh, I mean, Walt Disney didn't want to unionize his studio when he was still alive. Yeah, and there were so many women, especially yes. who were animators. Um, women editors and animators in the early stages of film were so fucked over by the industry because yes. they were women, and you know, it was a patriarchal system at that time. Yes, um, and it seems that while things have changed some of the common practices are still in place. Right. In some cases, it seems like, no, we change. It's like you kind of just gave lip service to things. It's, I mean, hell, there's a documentary out right now about the first black Disney animator and it's getting a lot of attention because, yeah, Disney would hire women. Disney, of course, hired men. There's a lot of white women and a lot of white men. There was not a lot of minorities at all and no black people and then this gentleman I forget his name off the top of my head got hired he became an animator and this documentary dealt with the all of the issues that he had to deal with because he's an animator at Disney who's also black I take it he was paid significantly less than I, anybody else I don't know the issues he dealt with I'm sure there were definitely issues of racism I don't know how 
if the production treated the, the company treated him any different versus how he was treated by fellow employees. But I do know that the documentary focuses on the fact that yeah, he's dealing. He would he dealt with a ton of bad shit. Do you know what this documentary is called? I don't know off the top of my head, but an easy enough Google search for documentary black Disney animator, I am sure will come up with a result. Because what else could you be talking about if you had all of that? Um, but yeah, this is something that isn't new, but it is something that still needs to be changed. And the change seems to be happening incrementally. And perhaps now, with how information is shared, it, ha it's, it can happen even faster. Uh, the documentary is called Floyd Norman in Animated Life. Yep, that's him, Floyd Norman. So that's definitely a plug yeah, to by all means, support that film by all as means, well. Take a look at that film. Take a look at more films with animators. Also, if watching Sausage Party, even with the, uh, you know, this unfortunate business around it of people being treated unfairly please don't have that turn you off to looking at animated films for adults there's a whole history of animated adult films out there oh the Ralph Bakshi and films are amazing like Coonskin is one of my favorite uh, there's very, films of his there's very good animated adult films there's very bad animated adult films by all means absorb as much as you can to discern your taste for what's good and what's bad or for you know what's good for what it is and bad for what it is um, and understand that yeah um, bad shit happens to very good people and you have to be vocal about it or else change never will never come to anything and right now this does this looks like a lot of bad stuff happening to a lot of people who just want to earn a living in a, in a particular field and they're getting taken advantage of and that's never good that's never good with it for anyone it gets taken advantage of yeah so let us know what you think and thanks for listening adios